Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. The Apostle Paul was compelled to write to a troubled group of Christians in Corinth, a church he had founded. There were divisions, scandals, arguments. Some were challenging Paul's authority and his teaching. To address the concerns of this community of faith, Paul listed his qualifications in the letter. Like that revelation of the risen Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus, his subsequent journey sharing the gospel, and the unending hardships, suffering, and persecutions he endured. Still, while sharing these things, Paul emphatically stated that he did not mention them in order to boast. Instead, he would only boast of his weaknesses so that the power of Christ would be seen and made clear. As an example, Paul wrote about a thorn in his flesh, a malady unidentified that bothered him. What that thorn was has remained a mystery speculated about through the ages. Paul wrote about his struggle, whatever it was, and how God finally helped him put it in its place. God helped him live with it. God helped Paul put that in its place. Three times I asked the Lord to take it away, Paul wrote. And the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. That's our theme, a mystery indeed. God's power made perfect in weakness. It's not something we like to think about, our weakness, that is. Ashes on our forehead is not something we, we like to relish either, a symbol of our weakness. Instead of a smudge of gray-black ashes, wouldn't we like to rather have a great big gold W for winter? <laughs> ashes make us uncomfortable. Ashes are a symbol of our mortality. We have bodies that are frail, that wear out. We suffer illnesses, and our days will come to an end. Ashes are also a symbol of our sin. From ancient days, the wearing of sackcloth, the heaping of ashes over oneself were a sign of public repentance. Through ashes, we acknowledge that yes, at times, our spirit and will oppose God. We think and act in ways that cause hurt and pain to others and ourselves. So why do we submit to this gloomy ritual? I can't think of a better answer than what one of our visitors said through the drive through today. There is no Easter without Lent, and there is no Lent without the ashes of Ash Wednesday. This is a holy journey, and this is how it begins. Now, the ashes that we make at the start of the season of Lent are formed into a cross. Weakness and power meet in the cross. That's the mystery. God said, my power is made perfect in the cross. This is a new Lent pyramid. 
It's beautiful. It's given uh, by the Lacander children in memory of their parents, Vernon and Elsie. Two wonderful, humble Christians who were part of Maple Grove Lutheran for many years. The idea for our Ash Wednesday, our Ash Wednesday service and the following Lenten series are actually inspired by the image on this cloth. In the center is a cross made of nails. We tend to beautify the cross, don't we? We make ornate crosses, we wear gold crosses. We beautify the cross, but we know the cross was an instrument of Roman terror and torture and intimidation and execution. The cross was a place where Rome crucified anyone opposing its rule and order, naked, abandoned, suffering unimaginable agony there. <clears throat> Around the, cr the cross of nails is a crown, but it's a crown of thorns, not gold. It is the pain that was worn, and the scorn that was worn, and the humiliation that was worn on the head of the Son of God, who was taunted by the soldiers. Hail, King of the Jews! And he did not retaliate. <clears throat> he bore this weakness, so that the mighty power of God would be revealed. And that's where it is revealed. That is our place of salvation. Where salvation appears. Where God's Son shows up for us. In a place of complete weakness. And so, here is another truth. God shows up in our places of weakness. So, we receive ashes on our forehead in the shape of a cross, the sign of God's power made perfect in weakness. The cross, the sign of redemption, forgiveness, eternal life won for us. Jim and I learned about God showing up in our weakness through our inability to do anything to help when our second son, Jeff, was born with a congenital defect to his skull. And there was no choice for us, nothing to do, but to do something emotionally excruciating and necessary. We had to hand our eight-week-old to, over to a neurosurgeon to correct this condition. The neurosurgeon told us that Jeff was born with a skull that wasn't going to grow right. Um, when we were born, it's kind of kind of reminds me of the, the globe with the, the floating continents. We have about seven plates. Uh, let's back up to the Halloween picture. There we go. We're going to start there in a minute. Plates with sutures, you know, openings between so that our head can grow and expand a little bit as it's needed. But some of Jeff's sutures had fused prematurely. And so they were going to have to open those surgically. We counted down the days with increasing stress and gloom. We were clingy with our little baby. We cherished every little bit of time with him and tried to make it special, like taking his three-year-old brother, Ben, and little Jeff, who can't even sit, be propped up yet properly, dressed him up and took him to a Halloween party at the De Gallier Estate and at the Dallas Arboretum. And Jeff, being the youngest participant, he won a prize that night. We were so happy. It was this weird green glow-in-the-dark rubber um, skeleton, which Ben promptly named Scary Bone Man. <laughs> <laughs> well, just a few days after that outing, and after a totally sleepless night, we got out of bed and gathered our baby in our arms and got into the car with our pre-packed over, pre overnight bags, and we drove to Medical City. On our drive, I remember blurting out, Jim, turn around, let's just drive to Mexico. 
we laughed nervously, but kept going. The hardest moment was after the nurses had worked on baby Jeff and put his little gown and IV on and the monitor hooked up and they took him away. And we were so worried, we tried not to even think what was actually going on in the surgery room. And that's when Pastor Nasan, our pastor, showed up. He, to this day, reminds us of Father O'Malley, for those of you who know the character that Big Crosby played in a number of endearing movies. The epitome of kindness, assurance, and a twinkle in his eye. He saw our faces, our tears, and I, what I always remember and want to share is the look of surprise on his face. Why are you worried? <laughs> he wasn't asking that insensitively at all. It was a moment of revelation for me, a moment that straightened my spirit up. Pastor Nasson and Borky had kids of their own. They knew what it was like to fret over your kids. He walked into that place, showed up to be with us, with a confidence in God and strength of faith, and it stopped me short, and my spirit that had been bowed so low was raised up right there. And we lifted our son in prayer together, and we felt Jeff safely tucked in the Lord. Okay, I was still almost crying, but... <laughs> Jim and I also saw God show up for us that day in our weakness. But more, not just our pastor. God showed up in the pediatric neuro neurosurgeon. I just looked up. Of course, I remember his name to this day, Dr. Derek Bruce. Honey, he is serving at the Children's National Health System in the main hospital in Washington, D.C. And here's what it says about his distinguished career. Derek Bruce, MD, is one of the pioneers of modern pediatric neurosurgery. It was pioneering on our baby. <laughs> <laughs> He did good. God showed up in the co-workers. I just remember all the bouquets of flowers and cards. God showed up in a mom that Dr. Bruce's office gave me her phone number because her child had the same condition. And so I called her and she was so kind to answer questions and talk with me and reassure me. And God showed up in the ladies' auxiliary at the hospital each day with magazines or stuffed animals for our baby and a mug that I still have. It's on my desk in the office there, a coffee mug that I keep not to use but because of what it represents. And Jim and I had no sense before this of how God can show up in our weakness. How God shows up through community. We had no family in Dallas. The nearest family was at least two states away. But people came and filled our lives and walked with us and cemented such gratitude in us that we have wanted to show up for others ever since. All right, now onto a picture of pre-Christmas. I had to put a little bonnet on Jeffy's head for his first pre-Christmas card picture there. And then, by the time we reach Christmas, he's looking good. Look at that nicely shaped head. So now I always notice that. <laughs> but it would be an odd thing to say, what a nice shaped head your baby has. <laughs> but I'm looking. <laughs> this is the whole gospel story, actually, that God shows up. He shows up alongside Unlikely people, a woman about to be stoned, lepers, a Roman centurion, little children, even those dead or as good as dead, a thief on a cross. God shows up in the most unusual places too, starting with a manger, the wilderness, a raging sea, a mountaintop, and with you and me. in vexing problems that we wrestle with in times when we are overwhelmed, in the most difficult circumstances, in the deepest pain that we bear. 
He shows up in our weakness. And he gives us to one another to do the same. There is no Easter without Lent and no Lent without the ashes of Ash Wednesday. This is a holy journey and this is how it begins. The way to find strength for our journey in the ashes, in our weakness. And to that mystery and that grace and that love we say, Amen.